been honestly so uh, surprised by the response to this book. I was super nervous about releasing this one because it's it's just different, and I and I don't read werewolf novels, um, so I knew that it wasn't sort of following a lot of the lore and stuff. I was just super nervous about it. I thought people were gonna be like, "This isn't what I expected." So yeah, it's been really a re- it's thing. been a huge yeah. relief that everybody is excited about it. Yeah, it's yeah. not what you would think, but I'm enjoying it a, a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's what makes it interesting is that it's not the usual thing because I do read werewolves a lot. Me too. Um, I love them. <laughs> But, you know, seeing that you have gone through a completely different approach is actually very refreshing. Yeah, it's unique and different. And it's it's definitely something that you need after reading so many that are really the same. It, it's it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah, well, that's definitely. good. That's good to hear. I hope that that trend continues. <laughs> we'll just have to wait and see. Um, but it's going super well like better than any of my books have ever done at their beginning. But then I've never had a large established audience before when I've released a book. So, you know, that helps definitely. Um, But that's not a guarantee on web novel. There's some bigger authors than me that have put stuff out that hasn't taken off yet. And so I'm very thankful because it's doing far better than I expected. Um, And yeah, And I'm excited because, well, not excited. I'm sad because Beast is ending. And that has been a lot harder than I expected it to be. But I'm excited because with it ending, it gives me more time and space to finish the other stories and get this one off the ground. So it's kind of a mixed bag right now of feelings, (laughs) full of feelings. Mm -hmm. There's that gif, you know, from... um, anchor man where he's like i'm in a glass case of emotion and i always laugh whenever anybody uses that on the books because that's kind of how i have felt this this year i'm like i'm here and i'm feeling a lot of feelings Um, (laughs) some of them are awesome and some of them are awful and i'm just feeling feelings so yeah it's been fun to watch this one kind of um lift pretty quickly which I was not, um, I mean, I knew it would do, I knew it was going to be okay. Like I knew it wasn't going to be bad because I have a lot of really awesome readers who do things like show up for me just to be nice. Um, but yeah, I, I have, I've been genuinely surprised by the response. I thought people were going to be a lot more skeptical of it than they are. <laughs> hey, Eric is here. Eric is brand new. I mean, to, to discord, not to me. So y'all say hi to Erica. <laughs> Hi, Erica. Hello, Erica. Oh, no. Oh, oh, she left. Oh, I guess we scared her away. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Gosh. That was oh, sick. Back. It usually takes longer than that to scare people off. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Erica's like, I just arrived and everybody started yelling at me. <laughs> that was really funny. <clears throat> anyway, let's not scare Erica. I think she might be working on getting her sound um working all right can you hear me oh we got you hi hi i hit the wrong button you didn't scare me i promise (laughs) (laughs) i'm so glad you're here hey i don't know if you guys all know but Haley, who is in the chat here is emmy z who's the author of my like and mate of suicide forest and Love so, that book. It's so good. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to give uh, her a shout out because um, Haley, I put this uh, up on uh, YouTube um, so people will hear. If anybody is listening to this who has not been reading my announcements or talking to me in Discord, I'm a big fan of this new book called My Like and Mate of Suicide Forest, and it's one of the entries for the werewolf competition. So we need it to get a lot of support right up front, and it's doing really well. So if y'all haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Go take a look. I'm calling that Emmy is going to be one of the top 25 next year 
she does not wish for me to create an expectation, but I just want to be the first to say that it's going to happen so that when it does, I can tell everybody, see, I told you. <laughs> You're so sweet. I, I cannot, I cannot like, tell you thank you enough it just you're so sweet i'm sorry i have a cold i'm all congested but um you've been so supportive and i appreciate it it's it's awesome it's been really cool don't worry about it i have always waited for the day when i would have any kind of audience that i could point at anything because i wish that there'd been somebody there to do that for me for years um <laughs> So no, I'm I'm excited, and as you guys know, I don't usually tout a book like that, and that's because it has to be something that kind of grabs my attention. So well, that that means so much to me too. I just need to say real quick because like I was writing this book before I found um, King of Beasts, and uh, like reading yours, and you know, I feel like there's a lot of similarities, and at least the kind of relationship like the true mate like the love you know kind of thing and mm -hmm. so I obviously I fell in love with your book right away and it's really um helped me kind of you know write better um some of those difficult scenes like the love scene <laughs> <laughs> that you write so well um so just to have you like be a fan of it is is huge to me so I really appreciate it Oh, you're very welcome. I'm laughing because we were talking about this the other day and I was saying how um, my books on web novel are the first time I've ever written love scenes. Um, <laughs> and it's the first time I've ever written fantasy. And I can't decide whether I should have done these things earlier because I would have done better as an author or if um, I just all I needed all of these years of preparation to be able to do this stuff now. <laughs> Because I still, I still struggle with those scenes. Like I still struggle to feel like I'm communicating meaning in it. A lot of times, it it's really hard. I've I have another author here on web novel that I've had actually um, sort of critique a couple of my love scenes before when I've struggled with them. One of them I had blocking for that I was struggling with. I don't know. I think maybe Luca was around. There was a love scene where they were in a position that I understood a lot of people weren't familiar with. And I was trying, I was trying to describe it in a way that didn't kind of break the read. So you weren't getting this kind of robotic, well, first he did this, then she did that. You know, <laughs> I was trying to sort of lyrically share with the reader uh, this position. And it was so funny because what I discovered, because I wrote it and I was like, are people going to know what that is? And so I gave it to like four different people. And I said, tell me if you know what position they're in and tell me if you've <laughs> used that position before. And, you know, only one person had used it before and immediately recognized it. It was like, oh, yeah, this is blah, blah, blah. Everybody else got it wrong. <laughs> so I knew I was not describing it well, right? Everybody else was like, I think she's in front of him. Like, they, they were just like, I think her leg is over his waist. I'm like, no, 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 that's not it. Um, so anyway, there's, a, there's another author on web novel named Sunscar who is very popular with readers for her love scenes and, and somebody else recommended her to me and so I was like hey would you mind taking a look at and she did she helped me um, with the blocking of it basically like how to describe what they were doing and where limbs were and stuff like that <laughs> in a way that wasn't like weird but got the the thing across but what was hilarious was when I took put this scene out to a few different people I had a picture like a cartoon like a like a silhouette thing and I was like when you're done if you don't if you're not sure let me know and I'll send you the picture and then you can tell me if it's what you envisioned <laughs> and again one person so uh -huh. yeah sometimes <laughs> sometimes writing is a really unique headache and um, <laughs> stuff like love scenes uh, for me anyway this is what I mean I were talking about the other day it's really hard sometimes to know how what you're saying or what you're thinking is coming across to the reader who's not in your head. So you can yeah. say stuff and think that you're communicating one thing and then have something else entirely actually be what people take from it. And so love scenes can be really tricky. They always take a lot longer for me to write than other scenes. 
Well, you're so natural at it now. It might have taken you a while, but wow. Like when I read yours, you know, first time going through, I don't remember what chapter you were on um, when I first started these. But <laughs> oh, sorry. Was no, you're that... talking about something else. Oh, no. no. It's an yeah, accident. Man. It was not on purpose. I wrote Beast <laughs> and was just doing chapters and chapters and chapters and, and talking to my editor about when we were going to lock it and all this sort of thing. And then she's like, you've got to have it cliffhang on something that they want to read next. And I'm like, well, they're going to do it for the first time. She's like, that's the one. <laughs> so, that's so, so I funny. had like split up all the content into chapters. And, and she's like, okay, so just tell me what number it is. And I went back and it was chapter 69. And <laughs> I didn't even, like it wasn't planned. I hadn't even realized that's the chapter that it was. But I got all these comments. I think I deleted them because I was like, Ugh. but all these comments that were like, nice. That's what people say on web novel. Whenever you use the word, the number 69 or the number 420, I think it is the number mm. for marijuana. Anyway, people comment nice. And so it was like a joke with me and my editor. Cause I went at 69 and she came back. She went nice. That's and it, funny. it became a thing. <laughs> anyway, not important, but yes, the, the unique uh, challenges of that stuff, they don't feel natural is what I would like you to know. <laughs> so if you are a writer or becoming one, don't don't beat yourself up if you have to be kind of uh, working at this stuff. I still struggle with love scenes. I still struggle with how to, A, how to make them unique and B, how to communicate emotion <clears throat> through physical stuff. So... Well, you do it really well. Thank you. I promise you I'm not sitting here fishing for compliments. It sounds like I am. No, I, I no really, it doesn't. It's I really not, am. It just um, it, it, it remains to this day. I don't sprint anymore when I do uh, writer sprints with other authors where we set a timer for 20 minutes and then you race to see who gets the most words at the end of the 20 minutes. And I can sometimes win them when I'm not writing love scenes. And I never win them when I am because I'm a lot slower. They take a lot longer. Um, Want it to get it right. Well, they just, at least for me, because they're, they don't come naturally, I have to, the, the pictures, like the intention of them comes naturally, but how to describe those kinds of events without being, because one of the things for me as a reader um, I've read books that have love scenes in them for a long time, and I don't have any issue with that. Um, and I say everybody, you know, to each their own. You do you. But mm -hmm. I often find when I read these scenes in these very romantic books, there's a lot of authors that go from this sort of emotional journey with the characters into this graphic, almost pornographic description of, of sex and it doesn't yeah. feel the same to me and so my yeah. goal was always when I was going to do this my goal was always to have the love scenes feel like love scenes not sex scenes like I know it's a silly distinction to make but that's what I know but there is one there I is think one, there though. is because yeah. I've read some books where I'm like dang this this is getting a little too much like yeah. it's not about love anymore it's just about sex yeah well, you know I've read some books that go in some extremely uh intense directions and yet still contain the emotion of it and like there's one author in particular that I that I read who she's got stuff in her books that I wouldn't even like not only would I not go there I would not choose to read it like it's just not for me but mm -hmm. she so takes you on this emotional journey between these characters that you're like, oh, totally, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. and you, you don't lose, or at least I didn't, lose the emotional connection with these rather intense uh, physical things going on. Um, and even though at the time, because I read this years ago, even though her whole series, and even though at the time it, I didn't really connect, all I recognized at the time was I have not read another author that I would have stuck with that book. Like if, if I'd been reading that kind of content from any of the other authors I'd read, I would have put it down because it was just too much for me mm -hmm. personally. Um, but because of how she took me into it and, and I could feel the emotion between the characters in it, 
I stuck with it. And even though I wasn't really consciously thinking about it at the time, because I wasn't writing those kinds of scenes myself, I do remember having a sort of little time of, you know, because I, I know her and I can talk to her. I do remember having a time of just thinking like, what is different about how she does this that I can enjoy reading that when that's not something that I would enjoy in real life? Like I couldn't figure out for a long time, but now I think I know. Now I think it's to do with that emotional connection and, and being able to build that into those kinds of interactions so that you don't feel, it, it isn't just sex. It is about expressing something. And that was my goal always with these books, not just with Beast, the others as well. But um, I think Beast is the one that's really connected for people. So I'm sad. I'm sad that it's going. I'm going to miss Reth. I do miss Reth. I finished writing Reth on Wednesday. I had finished the story, the plot story last weekend, I think it was. But I had a few days of some extra content for December that I had to finish up this week. So, yeah, it was a really weird experience this past week, going, taking rests out of my calendar because I have a writing calendar where I prep sort of a month or two in advance which book I'm writing when and how many chapters I have to do and all that kind of stuff. And um, going through and crossing out the, the weeks, the days in December that I was supposed to be writing him, I was like, no. <laughs> Don't take my breath away. <laughs> it's really sad. I'm very pathetic about it at the moment. <laughs> it is very sad. Breath is my favorite. Yeah, he's mine too. Yeah, it's weird because he's mine in some ways. In a lot of ways, he's my favorite. He's not, but he's different. I don't even know how to explain it. He's just special. He's well, of all your leading men, I just prefer Breath. <laughs> You know, like I, I like to read him. Yeah. And, but I do enjoy all of your male leads. I think they're all great. And I can see aspects of each of them that um, I absolutely love and adore. But if I would to pick one, it would have to be Reth. You know, I probably would say the same only from this standpoint. And maybe this is the difference with him. Of all of my characters, he's the most centered like he's mm. the most solid. Mm, um, yeah. All mm -hmm. the other guys have some level of brokenness that he doesn't have. And I love a broken hero. Like I love a guy who knows his own weakness and is like fighting to overcome it. So I'm never going to stop writing those guys. But I think the difference with Reth is that he feels like he's already got it figured out. Mostly. <laughs> Except but that could actually be his weakness, too. Yes. Well, it is because it trips him into things yeah. that, you know, stuff that he could have avoided because he's just like, I can handle it, you know. Well, um, yeah, he's definitely stumbled a few times. <laughs> Especially at the beginning. I had some yeah. new readers coming through the comments recently, and I had a whole rash of, why isn't he telling her? He needs to tell her. I don't know if you guys remember right back at the beginning when she comes to the anima. Um, well, no, well, oh. that too. But remember, Reth was really oblivious and she kept stumbling into these cultural situations where she was expected to do something yeah. a certain way or whatever. And he hadn't No, I remember those feelings. And so it was yeah. really frustrating. And I had forgotten because they've come so far since then. But I had a whole oh, yeah. bunch of new readers start at the same time and, and they were all getting to that point at the same time. And I got a sort of a dozen comments over a couple of days about why isn't he telling her this? I thought, oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Oblivious. But <clears throat> anyway, fun times. So just so you guys made him grow. No. Yeah, well, it does. And he's... um. I love, oh, so this is what I was going to say before. I think if I had to be stuck in a crisis with any of my guys, it would be Reth because I feel like he's the most equipped to deal with them, <laughs> whatever whatever the crisis might be. Um, yeah. well, secondarily, he, it more... would be Dane, even though he's traumatized, he has a bunch of skills and like. Um, well, he's very methodical in his thinking too. Yeah. But anyway, 
So yes, I love Ruth as well. And Ruth is my happy place. Like he's my, he's my favorite <laughs> to write from the standpoint of, I love being in his head. It's very rare that I don't want to be in his head. All the other guys, I have little phases with them where it's painful to be with them because of what they're going through. And mm -hmm. that happened with Reth when he and Elia got separated. Um, yeah. And I had to write the yeah. scene where he's at home and finds the letter. And that one just about killed me. Um, mm. Yeah, I cried a lot in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, Janelle, you cry a great deal and I love that I you do. do and I'm really touched that you do um, but I'm, a, I'm a crier Janelle I'm a crier so don't feel that <laughs> that's good I'm good I am too and it's so funny I cry a lot more as a reader than I do as a writer but I cried with Reth I cried with Reth and I cried with Dane as well so maybe it's about my connection with them I don't know but I also cried in your book too um the suicide forest with that whole horrible scene with um, Marius or Mers. How do you say it? Oh, um, you can say it any way you want, <laughs> but I say, I say Marius. Um, okay. But yeah. yeah that, which, which one? The, the most recent? Yeah. The one he was oh, chasing after her. Dear. Yes. That was. Yeah. I need to catch difficult. up on this. Another oh, really, one, another really hard one to write. I think those like, violent kind of scenes you know mm. i mean those are really hard too um but yeah yeah so i i, I was like panic crying i was like oh my god oh, my god. <laughs> oh. <Panic crying. laughs> like don't I panic stress. keep breathing <laughs> yeah. keep breathing i know right <laughs> you tell me that all the time <laughs> i know well it's become my mantra now it's not just with you like i picked it up there was a there was a time there where you you were the first one to say it i think where you commented one day i'm um i can't breathe and yes. i was like oh no this is not good yeah. um, but there were several people because i i can't even remember what the scenario was i, yeah, think I don't it remember was, either it was back at, in volume two i think but anyway um, it was stress. There was a, a few stress. different people that commented similar things in a short period of time. And I was like, no one is allowed to suffocate. Everyone has to keep breathing. Because <laughs> people were I like, think... I had a couple different who were like, I have to take my anti-anxiety meds before I read your book. I'm like, that's not good. Like, the, you might want to consider intense... putting it down. <laughs> The most intense for me in Beast, and this might, I mean, I think maybe it's just in volume one, but it was when they were, like, doing the whole, oh, is Lucene, like, the real, you know, is it okay yeah. to talk about that stuff? Like, yeah. everybody's read yeah. that, right? I think volume one is fine to talk about. I think, I don't think anybody's here who hasn't been around for a while. So, yeah. No, yeah, that you're was... talking about the, when um, Lucan took the petition to the elders, and then... Yeah. Uh, Brant decided that there was a chance Lucene was actually the correct queen. Uh, yeah, I felt my chest like tighten. Like I could, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't handle this. Yeah. Oh, what almost broke me was when Reth fell to his knees and was like, "Don't take her away from me." And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, um, wonderful." <laughs> I love I, him. Yeah, I was just, I was bawling. I was like, no, don't take her away. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that was stressful. That was at a time, too, where I sort of felt like, you know, sometimes in some of these stories, you can kind of judge where it's going. But with that, you know, that point, it felt like it could go in so many directions. And mm -hmm. I feel like you were kind of prepping us for that. Like, I think when Reth was saying, well, here are the things that can happen. And he was describing them, and I was just like, "Oh no, this can't, this can't be what's going to happen." It's you didn't it's, know which way you were going to go at all, yeah. and that's I think that's what added to the stress of the situation because you love these characters and you don't want to have any harm to them, but you know something's going to happen, and you just don't know what. Yeah, that was hard. Well, just so you guys know, and this is one of the beauties of writing. Um, I plot ahead. But when I got to that portion of the story, when I got to the scene where um, Elia leaves Reth, so the horns blow and he's got to run. And she's like, yeah. I'm going to go back to the cave. I'm fine. And he's like torn about it. She's like, no, go. 
and mm-hmm. then she gets intercepted by Lucan. So oh, I that had was it horrible. plotted from there to the scene where um, Lucine confronts um, confronts her at the cave. I did not have the petition. I did not have the elders and I did not have what ended up being the scene with the, or the scenes uh, in the amphitheater with the people. Um, Originally what was supposed to happen was the, or what I had originally planned was that Lucan would bring the petition and Reth would shoot it down and censor the people. So there's a, there's a mention prior to this where he talks about, or one of them talks about when there's a problem within the kingdom, um, the ruler can, what's called censor the people or censure the people. And it's where they basically stand up and put their leadership on the line and say, this is the direction we're going. Here is how you're wrong. If you don't believe me, you need to challenge me and take me out because this is what we're doing if you stick with me. And it's kind of a, um, in fact, for any of you who were here early in New Cardaloon, she was helping me out with that because I was planning to do the, the censure. He was going to basically lift, list, off, uh, list off the sins of the people and have to win them to his perspective um, to keep her safe. And then the, the wolves were going to revolt out as a result of that. Oh. Um, that was what the original plotting plan had been. And I got from, I got to Lucan doing the petition and taking her to the elders. And it started going in a direction that I hadn't planned. And I just went with it. Like I just followed it. <laughs> I had not planned for Reth to kill Lucan. I had not planned for Laren. I had not planned for um, for Lucine to be viewed as um, a potential queen. Like none of that was in my original plotting for the wow. end of volume one. But it started coming together and I could see that it was good. So probably the re- what, I, what I'm trying to tell you is probably the reason you didn't see it coming was because I didn't see it coming. <laughs> so I didn't <laughs> foreshadow it the way I normally would. Um, but it worked. Well, so yeah, um, it was you know, great. Praise the Lord. For it that. added a lot of, <laughs> yeah, it was so complex and I love complex stories like that. So, I do great. too. I'm just grateful that it came off because, um, I really was writing in a panic at, well, not in a panic, but at the time I was really uncertain, um, whether I could draw all the pieces together. Because as soon as we went off my, my plot plan, until I got it back to her at the cave, getting confronted by Lucene, um, it was all unknown territory. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, the whole thing with uh, Candace and Gari was not planned ahead. It was, I mean, I started to see it coming once I, once I realized where we were going um, with uh, Reth sending her over then then that stuff came in but when i first started on that path none of that was in there so does that mean you didn't have the prophecy conceived yet um i knew where we were going uh so what the prophecy entails in terms of where that's going to end up like what's going to happen in the kingdom so to speak i knew that um but I hadn't worked out all the little details of how I was going to bring it together. And I honestly okay, don't so- remember. I did have a, I did have one plan that didn't involve a prophecy. Um, but once I realized I had Gari in position and he could read the winds. And um, so like him coming back by himself was not, mm-hmm. oh, shoot, I'm getting into later material and I need to stop doing that. Anyway, oh. there's a lot. There's a lot <laughs> <laughs> that um, once I got into it, then I could sit down and plot it out and kind of figure out where it was going. But there's a lot when you guys, whenever you guys are like, I just didn't see it coming. I'm thinking, yeah, it's because I didn't either. <laughs> 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 so we'll learn it together. <laughs> anyway. That's what's so cool. It's so cool about it, I think. And I, I learned this after myself, after writing, which I was surprised about, is that it sort of takes on a life of its own. Like you give these characters their you know, their lives and then they, you know, they kind of take off and you just kind of follow them. Um, So it's neat. 
Well, and you get to a point to which you're probably finding now with the amount of material you've written, you get to a point where you know the characters so well that when uh, you're writing a dialogue or something's happening, you can anticipate how they're going to respond, even if it's new. So like with Reth, when that petition was brought, even though that all went in a direction that I hadn't planned, I didn't have to sit down and, and, and start to plan it because I knew as soon as I could see the conflict that was coming up and the potential with the Lucene thing, um, I went, oh, because I knew exactly how he would respond to that. I knew exactly what his thoughts would be. I knew what his feelings would be. I knew what his instincts would be and what he would have to fight to sort of keep himself, you know, in the right place. But like the, um, the scene where uh, they're up on the mountain and Elrith is conceived, none of that was uh, pre-plotted. Um, oh, that was so, so cool. That was, a, that was another fun discovery. Um, but again, they needed that so much. What's that? I said they needed that so much, Reth and Elia. Yeah. 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 And that was the thing. I got so deep into the emotion of what was going on between the two of them, like the confrontation um, that they were facing from others and the way that that would draw them together, um, mm -hmm. that it was just a really natural response. Like I knew that he would go, okay, so we need to be off by ourselves because he knows he knows the repercussions that could come of it she doesn't she's she walks into that blind having no clue what's at stake but he immediately understands what could go wrong and where it could take them mm -hmm. um but i'll tell you i don't know if you guys have ever read it um the sarah j mass's um a court of thorn and roses series um mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. sorry the so it's a series of well there's four books about the original couple and then there's some spin-off books and i'm not as big of a fan of the spin-off books but the original series the accord of thorn and roses original series is three or four books and uh the main romantic lead of the series is my favorite book boyfriend ever like ever. and i always hoped to write somebody like him like not the same as him but where i could give readers the same experience that i had reading this character and there's a scene in that series very very different setup and a very different threat but a scene where they're they're there together in a group and their relationship is being um threatened like they're threatened they're they're the the magical connection that they have is being threatened to be stolen from them and it was so well written at least for me when i read it the torment of his the things that he was feeling and what he went through and what he did in that whole setup, I was just like, oh, gut punch. Um, and that was yeah. what I, I was reminded of when, when Reth and Elia were in front of the elders and Reth knew what was coming. Like he knew where it could go. It, I was re remembering those scenes from uh, Sarah Mass's uh, series and going, okay, I got to try and, <laughs> I got to try and do this justice because I had to it ahead. Yeah, punches. <laughs> You succeeded in a gut punches, yes. Yes, very much so. Oh I hope so. No, you did. Yeah, <laughs> you did. no doubt. <laughs> that was the most heart-wrenching I had because breath, you, know, you just love him so much and you don't want that to happen to either of them. And the way yeah. he just shattered was just so, so painful and you just wanted to just punch yourself in the gut too. Yeah. See, for yeah. me, it was when he took her back to the bedroom when they were at the cave and she had finally accepted that she had to go and he took her back to the bedroom by himself. And it's when he makes the vow to her and to Elrith 
that for me, that was the gut punch. Like the other stuff was hard and painful and I didn't want to see him go through it. But that scene, that was the scene that was like making me tear up while I was crying and stuff. Because his intensity in that scene for me, and maybe I didn't um, deliver it for you, (laughs) but for me. It was a tender, sweet moment, but. Well, he's, Sorry, no, it's fine. He, to me in that scene, yes, he's absolutely expressing love and tenderness and, and protectiveness and all of that. But his personal, uh, he's in such turmoil there because he's so certain that it's the right thing to do. And he's so certain that he has to do it. And it's the, the thing that in the world that he least wants to do. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, and that's, to be fair, that's the goal. I've, I've been in a lot of writing workshops and I've studied a lot about the craft of fiction and every writer coach I've ever heard has always talked about, figure out what is the one thing your character absolutely does not want and put them in that position, <laughs> like find a way to put that's them there cool. so they have to face it and, and, and be victorious, triumph over it. And even though that wasn't, like I say, that whole setup was not planned originally, um, being separated from Elia was definitely Reth's no-no, right? That was his bottom Mm -hmm. line, last thing he would choose. So I knew that was coming and that was, that was rough. That, that chapter cold Mm -hmm. home when he's reading that letter, like I was like, (laughs) in my office, I'm like, if anybody ever watched me work be the most ridiculous <laughs> thing because sometimes I'm laughing and sometimes I'm crying and I'm singing yeah. songs and I'm looking for songs on my playlists that have the right emotion to write the scene and it just feels so dumb <laughs> like sitting here having all these emotions in an empty room by myself but yeah but you, I think, convey it. you convey it yeah, so you- well yeah. yeah, and then with that, you're giving us those same kind of emotions and we're having our own little cry fest in our rooms <laughs> while we're reading it. Well, to yeah. be fair, Janelle, you cry a lot more than I do. So, you know, <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's me doing my job well or the opposite of that. <laughs> Perhaps I've stepped too far into the... No. I do, I'm just teasing you, sweetie. I'm not intending no, I know, at I know. all to <laughs> be mean. No, I just... no you're fine. No, I get teased a lot because I cry at movies all the time. Like the new Cinderella that came out years ago, that live action one. I cried five different times in that movie and I was bawling with my friends. And all my friends looked at me like I was the weirdest thing. So you're fine. (laughs) No, I cry in movies and in books as well. Um, As a writer, I tear up a lot. I don't usually like have to do the full on blow my nose, you know, tears running down my cheeks. That sort of thing. That only happens on rare occasions because usually I get a lot of preparation for those emotional things. So, um, but yeah, no, I'm I'm a big crier in movies and and books as well. But I I'm ash- ashamed is too strong a word. I don't like people to see me cry because I don't want them to tease me. Same. <laughs> so I'm always yeah. like Same reading way. late at night when my husband's asleep, and if I'm crying, I'm like. <laughs> I'm trying to be all quiet because I don't, I don't want to wake him up because then he gets all worried. What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm like, he's just a really sad part of the book. And he's just looking yeah. at me like, what is up with you? Yeah. And I do that even if I know it's coming. Like if I'm rewatching something and I know I'm going to cry because I've always cried, I still cry. <laughs> oh, I do in some, in some movies and stories. It depends on the – and also how long it's been since I – last you know went through it but yeah I hear you I hear you did any of you guys have any questions about the end of Beast I'm not going to tell you plot stuff but if you have any questions about how that's all going to come together next month or Um, anything about the 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 I don't know just is there any are there any questions about that before I move on to other stuff I do have a Beast question go for Um, it now, before Elia went back to the human side, everyone was saying that she could like have a mental breakdown. And mm-hmm. during that time, people were afraid she was having her mental breakdown. Mm-hmm. My question is, has she been affected mentally 
by going back and being there for how long was she there? Like what, two or three months? So is there anybody in here who's not into, um, I think it would have to be volume three. Is there anybody here in the chat who's not yet up to Elia coming back from the human world? Because I don't want to answer that question if I'm going to spoil it for anybody. I don't think there is. So if you're listening to this afterwards and you have not read volume three, maybe skip ahead about five minutes. <laughs> um, so what's so there's there's one or two really important points with that. Um, the reason that humans are affected going back into the human world after being an anima is because anima is um, healthier for them. Physically, it's healthier. It's a it's a healthier environment. Um, but also, there's some. I know supernatural is probably too strong, but there's some elements to the way people live and the way they relate in anima that, um, in my mind, is at the core of what humanity needs. And um, so when they, so there's two things that happen. If a human goes and lives in anima for a while and then they leave and they go back, um, they're very prone to extreme depression um, Mm -hmm. because uh, they lose on both a physical and sort of spiritual level when they go back. Um, But also because of the voices and the things that they say and do to people when they cross, there's an element too of kind of a torment that people can go through because of that. Um, so those things can can combine to make them worse. The reason the anima believe that crossing the worlds is why the humans go go crazy or die um, is because they don't. It's happened so few and 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 so far apart there's never sort of a generation that's had a whole bunch of them do it and then go and then come back and like all they have is like these kind of historical accounts um, of things uh, of this. So what the anima believe about crossing isn't entirely true. Some of the stuff that they believe is because of the stuff that you see um, Gari and and Elia find out, or Callie find out the things that have been hidden in order to avoid certain truths coming to light. So there's some deception that's occurred earlier in the anima history to make the anima think that so that there won't be a lot of this back and forth because that they know that this is where the threat is going to come from. Um, but on top of that, you do have actual impacts of, of, of it when people cross back. There are genuine problems that that causes, especially for human beings. For Elia, yes, when she went back, she had all of those impacts. So yes, she was depressed and she was anxious and she was tormented and there was a lot going on for her. She was in a really bad space, um, but she was in a bad space circumstantially. Right. On a physical level, she was becoming anima. So the risks of that were actually lessened by the physical things that were going on in her body um, because some of the protection that the anima have was was becoming part of her. Um, So even had they not had the circumstances that they did, she would have been fine. Well, fine's probably a little bit blasé, but... She wasn't going to go over there and die purely because she crossed. That wasn't going to ever be the problem for her. The problem was keeping in perspective what was going on and being separated from Reth and, you know, pregnancy hormones. And like, she had a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and then the battle she had with the beast um, and the fear that that created you're gonna learn more about that at the end of the book um you're coming up yeah in the next week or so inside the next two weeks you're going to hear some stuff from Elia that you have not heard before about why that whole battle is so hard for her 
Um, okay. And that's going to, that's going to do, that's going to explain some of this as well. Um, but yeah, just probably worth keeping note that some of what the anima believe about the impacts of crossing actually isn't true or isn't entirely true. Okay. I think that's the best way to put it. Because okay, I was just, with all her fear, when she came back, I was like, was that how she was affected? So that was basically what I was Her fear wondering. is trauma. Like, she, but, she and Reth both are legitimately traumatized by everything that has happened. And this is another thing that I love about Sarah J. Mass. She writes so many fictional characters that are kick-ass characters go through these horrific events and come out of the other side this, like, nothing can touch me you know, I'm a superhero kind of character. And it's just not realistic. Even when people win, when you go through really difficult things, you get traumatized by it. And it's yes. generally not until you do get out of the crisis that that trauma starts to crop up and you realize you've been affected by it. And one of the things I love about Sarah Mass is that she writes that into her characters. Like when they do things and have to do things and have things happen around them and happen to people that, that they love, they experience the trauma of it afterwards. And I always admired that because I think so few fiction writers do that justice, right? And, I agree. And, it's, and it's a, it's a unrealistic reflection when we see strong people who come out of something hard and they're just like, yeah, take that. No one actually, <laughs> that's not actually how it works. Um, I saw a thing on Facebook not very long ago where it said, just because I'm strong doesn't mean it didn't take, doesn't mean it wasn't hard to carry or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea being that just because somebody is equipped to deal with something doesn't mean that there isn't a struggle in it and doesn't mean that it doesn't affect them. Right. So you can get through something because you are strong enough to do that. It doesn't mean it doesn't touch you. It just means that you had what was needed to get through it. Now you have to deal with the fact that you've been through it. And that was what I'm trying to do with Reth and Elia. When she comes back, both of them were in this headspace where as soon as I'm with them, I'll be fine. Like they both thought that all I need is for them to be back with me. Um, but then they discover actually that's not true and for Elia in particular, but for Reth to a certain degree as well, having him there. Have you guys read the scene where she says, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I didn't expect to still be so afraid or it seems like yeah. it's made it worse. Cause At least I have. Yeah. So she says to him, I thought when, when we were together again that I wouldn't feel afraid anymore, but actually the opposite is true. It seems like I'm more afraid now. Hmm. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but my experience with big life things um, is that often the impact of it doesn't hit you until after it's done. And then you kind of fall apart <laughs> a little bit. Or when you experience almost losing someone who's really important to you, um, Yes, you're grateful that you didn't lose them, that they're still there. But the fear of losing them can actually increase as a result of it. Because mm -hmm. you become, wow, this is real. Like this can actually happen. You've been in a position to experience that that threat. And so that was what I was trying to show with them. Was that um, even when, you know, there's this return and even when things are good, um, it doesn't mean that there's no after effect of all the things you've been through. And that's what they're going to walk through now until the, until they get to the end, which I'm excited for you guys to read. <laughs> P yes. So Rachel's in the text chat and she said they have PTSD. Yes, absolutely. So they're experiencing, um, I don't know how much you guys know about how your brain reacts and stuff, but in a, in a, in a nutshell, what trauma essentially does is it hardwires your brain to click into survival mode when there's certain stimulus in place. So like a child who grows up in a, an abusive home, um, 
you might see a kid at a school that suddenly um, disappears under their desk for no apparent reason and doesn't want to come out and they want to work down there. And the kid probably doesn't even know why they suddenly felt like they needed to do that. But what's happened is something has happened in their environment that's made their brain go, danger's here and we need to get away from it. So like for a lot of kids who grew up in abusive homes, a slamming door, even if it's like in the distance, you know, maybe a door slams in the hallway and they just hear the echo of it, but their brain goes danger, right? And so they have this like, uh, your, oh, there's a specific name. There's a part of your brain that's basically purely emotion <laughs> and it's about survival and it's what kicks in and you hear people talk about fight or flight or freeze. They now recognize that that's a third option. People's survival instinct kicks in. Either they will freeze, run, or fight. And, and the problem is if you have any kind of trauma that gets triggered by, I don't know, somebody uh, disapproving of you or like really mundane things, right? Um, trying to, I can't come up with a good example right now, but the slamming door is probably a good one. The wind blows a door closed and it slams and it slams on the other side of the house. It's not even close to you. So you don't really register it, but your brain has been wired to understand that when it hears that noise, the experience that you've had in the past is that you've been attacked in, in the in the you know the wake of that so your brain goes time to time to protect right one way or the other however you react fight flight or freeze um and that's what trauma does is it makes you kick into your survival instinct and when you kick into your survival instinct if the only threat in front of you is the spouse that's arguing with you or the child that's being disrespectful or whatever you can respond really strongly to a situation that is actually not that big of a deal but in the moment you don't realize that because in the moment everything in your brain is saying it's survival time and as somebody who has struggled with this but on what most people would consider to be fairly mundane levels I can tell you that if, if you're somebody who finds that when you get um, in an argument where something happens and you can't get free of it for a good hour afterwards like you can't calm down you're, or you can but you can't um, like you can't handle talking about it or you don't want to be around the person or whatever you need you know half an hour an hour after that's probably because your trauma instincts kicked in Apparently, the baseline for slipping out of this name of the brain points escaped me now, but there's a small center of your brain. When you when that kicks in, the minimum amount of time it takes is 20 minutes for your body to go, oh, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm, wow. I don't need to survive. Um, which means that for that 20 minutes, if you get stimulated again, <laughs> it starts again, right? So for a lot of people who've had a lot of trauma in their lives, and I'm not one of them, but had a great deal of trauma, they can go hours or days in that state. And you'll have a kid that starts acting out and nobody understands why. And this is why. It's because their brain's kicked into survival mode and they can't get out of it because they keep getting re-triggered. Uh, amygdala, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Luca knows what I'm talking about. Um and anyway, so it's a real problem because a lot of people don't understand it unless they experience it. But it's also that part of you that you look at a situation afterwards and you're like, why did I react that way? Like, why did I, why couldn't I just, why couldn't I have just said, yeah, it's not a big deal. All he did was break a dish. Like, what's the big, you know what I mean? Like you look at it later and you're like, why did I get so upset about that? Chances are your trauma instinct kicked in and you flew off the handle and you were in panic without even realizing it. Because if your instinct is fight, when your trauma instinct kicks in, you, you'll you argue or you will, like, you will draw a line. You will not move from it. Like, this is, this is where I am and this is my line in the stand. Don't you dare step across that because if you do, I'm going to smack your face, you know. Like, you, you don't even realize you're doing it. I'm speaking from experience here. You don't even realize you're doing it you have this response and it seems completely right and natural in the moment. It seems completely rational. It's not until later <laughs> when, you, 
when you're no longer in the amygdala and your rational brain has kicked back in that you're like, wait, why did I get so upset about that? Or why was I so scared of that? And this happens in relationships a lot where people are triggering each other and they don't even realize they're doing it. So he says something that she probably doesn't even realize is triggering this kind of response for her, but she flies off the handle because of what he said, which then triggers his response. So now he's fighting too and they're going at it and they're both in this like aggravated state. And then afterwards everybody feels defensive because you're very vulnerable. Like that's the whole point of a, of a trauma response is because you feel vulnerable and you feel that you were under threat, whether that was the intended, whether that was the intention of the other person or not, that's how you felt. And it's really hard when you feel that way to look at it and go, oh no, he was just having a bad day. (laughs) Like, because you feel it. You feel it for real, whether it is real or not. And this is fear is something that I talk to women about so much because when you feel fear, it's as if the threat is actually happening, even though it's not right. So you can get up in the morning and you think you're fine um, and something happens and you're now, maybe you have an anxiety attack or whatever. The point is the, the, the response that your body had to that situation is the same response it would have if the worst case scenario had actually happened. So you've effectively lived your fear, but you don't realize it. All you realize is that was really bad and I don't want to go through that again. And so you get in this anxiety cycle of trying to avoid fear because it makes you feel that way. When the reality is, if we can learn to sort of step out of that and and face it, this is the conversation that um, Jaya started with Elia recently. If you can learn to step out of it and face it, you can retrain your brain to understand that that is not a trauma trigger. You're actually okay. But in order to do that, you have to go through the trauma of it multiple times to get to the point where your stimulus changes. Oh, this actually isn't. So you're speaking to somebody who has a dramatic dental phobia. And I mean dramatic. I had, uh, I grew up in New Zealand where they had um, a school system, dental hygiene system. And I'm a redhead, whether that depends on the doctor you talk to, whether that's applicable or not. Um, But anyway, when I was young, I had uh, people doing dental work on me and not enough anesthesia. So it really hurt. And they didn't believe me when I told them it really hurt. And they would just keep doing it anyway. So it got to the time when I was like 12, I think, was when I moved into the adult system. And I was so traumatized by this that even the sound of a dental drill would make me cry. Still does to this day, (laughs) actually. Um, I didn't have dental work done without some kind of sedative until two years ago. And the process to get there, I can't tell you. But anyway, the point is when you have, when your body has a stimulus response to something that you can't control, facing that and, and having the courage to face it is harder than the event itself, I can tell you from experience. Um, but this is why so many relationships break up because we've had these bad experiences before and then we get into this other relationship and we we filter that person through all of our experiences before. And so he said that and it's the same thing that that guy said and so they must mean the same thing and the same thing's going to happen and that was terrible and I'm never, I'm leaving you. Like we can, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but my brain can do that in the span of about three seconds. I can I can relive my past fear and pain and come to the conclusion that I need to escape this entire scenario in the space of about three or four seconds. Um, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to get into this. I find this stuff fascinating. And so I try to bring it into my writing and stuff, but I don't normally sit here and explain it to people. No, Um, it's good. (laughs) But anyway, so that's what Reth and Elia are going through. They are both experiencing trauma and, um, and not understanding it in themselves. So having reactions, especially Elia, but rest to a certain degree as well, having reactions that are not rational, um, but feel real. And so they don't really know what to do. 
and they're going to have to work through that. They're going to be forced to work through that um, in the coming weeks. <laughs> Tune in next time. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there any other questions? And I'll try not to go off on 20 minute tangents this time. Well, you probably won't answer it, but will Gari survive the bears? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the I'll tell you the thing that I told everybody at the beginning of Queen when everybody freaked out. Yeah. When Queen happens, Gari is still alive. So I'll tell you that. But that's the extent that I'll tell you. Oh, I'm you'll have so worried to discover. About him. You'll have to discover the rest. Yeah, I figured you'd say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not gonna have you're not gonna have to discover it for too long. At worst case scenario, unless Web Novel do something uh, that I don't anticipate, which is possible. So, just so you guys know, Web Novel are gonna do an event for the end of Beast. I don't know what that event is going to entail. I don't know how big it's going to be or how long. Um, so I don't know whether to be excited about it or not, but they're going to do something for the end of Beast. Um, and so I'm in discussions with them right now about what to do with the last material. So what you're going to see, if you're in the top tier of privilege, you'll read the end of the major plot line on the 30th of November by web novel standards. So that's the 29th of November in the US. But there will still be some loose ends to tie up and some conclusion stuff after that. So there's a total of, I think, 22 chapters that are coming out in December. Um, and if you have top tier privilege, uh, you'll get to read all of them at least by the 10th of December. Um, but if you're not, don't freak out. What we're going to do is, um, the last, I think it's the last, uh, I'll have to look 25, I think, uh, chapters are going to be in privilege, uh, in December, but the rest are going to be released. So you'll get to read most of the main plot line, whether you have um, privilege or not. Um, so buying privilege in December is really only going to be, A, if you just can't wait, you want to read the whole thing when it comes out. Um, and B, there's going to be a couple of giveaways that only the privilege readers are going to be eligible for. But I am doing giveaways for everybody. There's also going to be giveaways for people who aren't in privilege. So if you're not in a position to buy privilege in December, don't freak out. You're still going to have access to some of the giveaways. Um, but as far as I know, unless web novel change something, which is possible, all of the content will be published by the 10th of December. And then I'll be really sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm also, uh, there is an opportunity. Well, when you get to the end, we'll talk about it when you guys get to the end. There's some stuff that might happen in the future. And once everybody's finished and been able to read it, then we can um, decide if we do some of these other things next year or not. But yeah, you're going to see the end the end, the end, the end, and the first half of December. And I'm going to do a big giveaway uh, thing for the first 12 days of December. I'm doing 12 days of giveaways. Um, and so what we'll do is um, basically you're going to, there's going to be things that you can do to qualify for entries each day. Uh, uh, regardless of whether you're in privilege or not, there are things you can do, and they're mostly simple, very simple things, um, commenting and things like that. Um, things that you can do each day to qualify or to get entry or entries for uh, the giveaway for that day. So, um, and then I'm doing that for 12 days. And then on the 12th day, is it the 12th day? Shoot, where is my phone? I need to look at my calendar. Um, uh, where are we? Sorry. I should have written this down. 
Um, yes. So the 12th day, well, actually the 13th for web novel, but the 12th for the USA is a Sunday. And that's the day that we'll do the voice chat in December. And that will be the final giveaway, Christmas giveaway. Um, so the biggest prizes will be given away on that day. And you'll get entries for being here in the voice chat to do it. And you'll get entries by doing stuff during the week um, on the book and, and on web novel and stuff. And so regardless of what web novel do, I'm not sure what they're going to do for the event. Um, you're going to have opportunities from me to win things like paperbacks and stuff like that um, just by hanging around those couple weeks and, and doing a couple things. Um, and hopefully we'll have some fun. And um, no, you aren't going to have to uh, buy me things or anything like that. Um, I think Christmas is all about giving. So I'm looking for some ways that we can um, spread the joy a little bit. So I'll give you guys some more details on that at the end of the month, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Sounds so fun. Super fun. Um, was there any other questions about beast? Is there any questions about alpha? Cause I did want to talk about that a little bit today um because there's been a couple misconceptions <laughs> about the book oh um, what oh no 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 is i don't mean i don't mean I don't, no 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 what's happened is um some people think that it's an animus story and they're looking i got a couple comments i've had a couple messages people think that it's actually an animus story and it's not and i just wanted to make that super clear Zev is not an anima. He is a chimera. He was made by humans. Um, I am going to put some Easter eggs in uh, Alpha for Beast readers, but those are mostly just fun references f that you'll recognize um, if you're okay. if you're a, a Beast reader. See, um, I thought one of your references or your Easter eggs was the fact that he took the cave to get in there and I was like, Oh, is this like another type of animal world? Because he, he went through a cave. I don't know. It seemed very similar to me. Yeah. And I guess I didn't get super creative there. What, what will happen as the story progresses, you'll actually get to see the crossing and then you'll see that it's very different, that it's not a traverse. Um, okay. So yeah, I didn't really think that through. I think when I, when I wrote it in, I didn't think about the fact that just using a cave would make the connection for people because you have to go through the portal cave. But um, no, the, 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 there's no voices for Zev. Uh, it's a completely different process. Um, it just so happens that the end of that process is in a cave in Thana um, because they need to be safe when they come through. So yeah, that's my bad for not being more mm. unique. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so fascinating to have both of those though. I hadn't made the connection like Janelle did with the traverse, but when you like, you think about it as sort of being, I'm, sh I'm sure you probably didn't intend this, but like a, you know, symbolism of, um, like birth or even like the cave, you know, some people say that those in stories are like wombs, you know? Huh. Um, so I think it's interesting that in both of those stories, you have kind of the symbolism of the traverse, which could be considered like, you know, this pathway, this in between. And I, I haven't read very, I, I haven't read as far as you can in King of Beasts. So I don't know if you describe the traverse more, kind of what's happening there, but, um, you know, having it be this like, uh, passageway where you know it's really difficult or there's some kind of you know kind of like birth like it's this almost trauma and I don't know so I don't have anywhere else to go with that I just wanted to mention I think the symbolism there is kind of cool thank you um there's definitely symbolism involved in it for me but it's less of that it's more um life lessons 
probably would be the way to way to phrase it. Um, and Zev's uh, gateway is is a different kind of lesson or a different kind of journey. Yeah, there is there is there is definitely a, a journeying or a pathway symbolism. Um, hmm. Rachel's asked in the text, does Zev get to have a spiritual awakening since he thinks he's soulless and has no connection to God? Um, yes, that's a good the question. <laughs> uh, Zev is full of existential questions. <laughs> And he's, <laughs> he's going to have to face those uh, based on some events that are going to happen later in the book. Um, I so, figured yeah. it would be because of the way Sasha had that such a huge reaction to his, well, his comments. And this is something that I don't think I delivered very well in that scene. I was uneasy about that scene and I didn't have time to go back and rewrite it. Um, she's surprised because he's not expressed this to her before. Because, of course, uh. he couldn't, when he was 19, sit there and say, by the way, I'm soulless because I'm half creature. You know, um, he couldn't talk to her about that whole side of his life. So he just didn't talk about it. Um, and so she's shocked because they've had conversations in the past about, you know, existence and God and all of that kind of thing. And he agrees with her. He does believe that God exists. He just doesn't think God has any interest in him um, um, because of what he is. And so he's going to have to face those questions. And so is she, um, because he's very conscious, uh, little, little heads up. He's very conscious that if she, if they mate, uh, and if they have children, uh, he doesn't know how his soulless state is going to affect his offspring with her, right? Because mm -hmm. in his mind, every chimera is soulless, and therefore they're all in the same state. But in in having a connection with her and believing that she's not soulless, he then has to face, you know, am I effectively, um, you know, condemning some child to being a soulless creature like me who didn't have to be that's in his mind that's where he goes with this stuff um so they're gonna have to work through those things but so yes i don't know if spiritual awakening is the right idea uh, i suppose it is it's more that he's gonna ask questions that i asked when i was a kid and he's going to get them answered, whether he likes the answers or not. <laughs> well, that's but, good. I'm looking forward to that. Well, it's it's not, you know, it's going to be a while, I think, because they got some they got some circumstantial stuff to get through first. But that's part of oh. his journey is all of these questions about his existence, because his existence is not a traditional existence. So, yeah, so I just wanted to clear up if anybody is listening to this who's not here right now. I've had a lot of comments or messages from people about but just basically assuming that Thana is just another piece of anima or just anima in another name. Um, and it's not. I just want to I just want to put that out there. It really is a different world, um, an alternate world. Um, it just so happens that it the gateway to it ends in a cave, which I didn't think about <laughs> how that might confuse people. So that's my fault. Did you guys have any other questions about um, Alpha, Zeb's story? I had, I had uh, kind of a question on the mate bond because mm -hmm. in the car, he said that they didn't have a connection, but then he told her that they did. So I was a little confused by that. Um, I'll go back and check and make sure that I did it right, because I think a few people took that out of it, too. I I believe what he actually says is that uh, he's talking about himself in the past and the way the humans uh, regarded him and what it was he could or couldn't do. And, and the conclusion that they came to was that he was the first chimera who could mate, uh, who could have sex without forming the mate bond. And so he was the first chimera who could be like a, a stud. I mean that not in the hot guy sense. I mean that in the no, breeding I know. sense. In the animal way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the belief was when he was a teenager that he would not form the bond when he had sex. And therefore he was useful to the humans in a way that none of the other chimera had been. 
Um, but when he talks to her, and I believe that whole conversation happens over several chapters, but in the course of that, he, he explains um, that what they realized was actually he can form the bond um, and was beginning to form the bond with her. And that was why Nick came and got him out because because the I th- if I remember correctly, they were talking about how the other five girls that he was with before Sasha was starting to die because they had formed a bond with him, but he didn't yes. form one with them. Yes. And That's and true. so that to me was saying, okay, well, then he did form somewhat of a bond or a, the beginnings of one with Sasha for that to, like, break from them. Yeah. But, so uh, um, I'm pretty sure this has been covered in the book, but if, I think I need to go back and, and make sure I've written it well. Um, in my mind, what Zev has the capacity to do is very similar to what I believe humans do, which is you develop that bond over time, right? So it's not this programming, so to speak. With the chimera, they are genetically essentially hardwired that when they have sex that they're bonded to that person and they become a mate pair which is great it's not a bad thing but it's just what happens for them right so in their Mm -hmm. culture you have to be very very careful who you choose to form that bond with because for them the bond comes from having sex right so chimera Mm -hmm guy meets chimera girl he meets six chimera girls he picks one the one he sleeps with that's when he forms the mate bond with it's not this um fate thing it's a it's a physical tangible sort of genetic thing that they have right and for me that's based on um a lot there's a lot of different animals that when they mate they mate for life like penguins yeah so there's a bunch of different animals that have that But there's also a bunch that don't. Um, But anyway, the ones that have it, a a lot of those species, they'll die if their mate dies. There's some that Mm -hmm. they just kind of waste away. Um, And I see a real horror and a real beauty in that. And for whatever reason, because it fascinates me, I wrote that into the chimera. (laughs) Um, So they don't die immediately. And it depends on the on the bond and it depends on the couple and how long they were together and a whole bunch of raft of other things. But if and when one of the mates dies, the other one will die sooner than they would have had they not lost their mate because it will eventually kill them. Um, but when they're separated, it creates a special kind of torment, kind of like an illness or a mental illness. Um, so there's a difference for the chimera if uh, their ta- if their mate is taken away, that's going to torment them and create health issues for them. But if their mate is killed, that will eventually kill them. They don't okay. ever recover from that. Um, so there's so, two different scenarios that the chimera fall into. But Zev is different. Zev can have sex without forming the bond. But the assumption that the humans made was that that meant he couldn't or wouldn't form the bond ever. Mm. Um, At least that's what he was told when he was a teenager, right? You can go have sex with whoever you want to or whoever we want you to because you're not going to form the bond. So So is that why he said... Sorry, go ahead. Is that why he told Sasha that they don't have that bond? Because that's what he believed? Well, at the time, that's what he believed. So, I'm uh, like I say, I'll have to go back and reread the conversation and try and find the spot where he talks to her about it and make sure that I've communicated it correctly. What it's supposed to do, what it's supposed to do is have him tell her that when they were teenagers and they first met, he believed he could not form the bond or would not form the bond, that he was not, that he was lacking the ability to do that. That he could just be in a relationship with her and care for her, um, but that he shouldn't have sex with her because culturally they didn't do that. And there was a risk and blah, blah, blah. They were basically when he went into the human world, um, it was there was a time there where he was being tested for a bunch of different things. And one of the things they tested him with was what would happen when he had sex with several different partners. 
And what they discovered was that the females that he had sex with, they, they formed the bond for him, but he didn't form it for them. So he went into high school <laughs> believing that that was just not a thing that would happen for him. That's what he was told. That was what the testing appeared to have, you know, the conclusion it appeared to have found. What he's since figured out is that he did form the bond with her. But for him, it doesn't happen the way it happens for the other chimera. Because for the other chimera, it's this lightning bolt thing. Like they have sex and it's there. And they're like, this is their partner for life. It's just a done deal. There's no process to it. It just happens. But for him, there was a process to it. And, and it deepened over time. And so that's okay. why he's then turned around and said, but, but we are forming the bond and that's why they don't want me with you. Um, because... Nick figured this out and figured it out before Zev did. Figured out what the difference was or what was going on before Zev did. So. That's, okay. that's I'll have to go reread it. Well, no, it's very possible because you're not the only person that took that from it. I had a bunch of comments the day that they had that first conversation. Had a bunch of comments saying, wait, he's not bonded to her. They're not bonded. And I was like, I didn't. Yeah, I think that, that was one of that. mine too. Well, no, it wasn't just you though. Like it was a ton of different people. And, and I went, is it just because they haven't finished the conversation? I meant to go back and reread it and check it. And I'll try to remember to do that this week. Um, so I can clarify it. I can edit it for later readers because, um, yeah, it's supposed to be that what he's relaying is what he believed when he was younger. And then he eventually gets to the conclusion and and tells her. But if he's if he's expressing it in a way that sounds like it's just that's the way it is, then then I've done it wrong and I need to edit it. <laughs> okay. The joys of serialization, I can go back and change it. <sighs> Did anybody else have any questions? I'm going to have to leave in about 10 minutes. Did anybody else have any questions about Alpha? Did anybody have any questions about anything at all? Cool. I'm sure I do. I just can't think of anything. You're fine. You're awesome. So really enjoying it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for listening to my 20 minute rant about trauma. <laughs> you get, you know, you get to um, what do you call it? Uh, hear my um, free association where my brain goes. It's fascinating. I when oh, you brought up like that part where Elia talks to is her name Jaya the the yes. wolf. Mm -hmm. Um, I I went through that kind of thought process where I'm like, I feel like I'm getting Amy's like knowledge <laughs> about this stuff. <laughs> you know, it's almost like it's transferring to me. And there was, I think I commented, like there was one part in particular in that conversation that I did a screenshot. Cause I was like, this is great. Like, this is brilliant. I need to go back and read it again. Just as like a practical life, like, you know, reminder. <laughs> That's so, awesome. No, yeah. I thought it was really deep and very insightful as well. Cool. Well, I'm only passing on what has been taught to me. So <laughs> I am the middle But isn't man. that what fiction's for? Well, you know what? I've always felt that I hear comedians talk about comedy as a way to bring truth to people that they're not defensive against because mm -hmm. it makes them laugh. And I think fiction and particularly romance is, is another vehicle like that. You can bring things to people that are true, but you're doing it in a way where you're not confronting it, if that makes sense. It's it's, yes. it's an opportunity to think about it. It's a context to see it at play, but you don't have to. It's not me sitting in front of you going, now you need to hear this. You know what I mean? So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I agree, because that way you're softening the blow, as it were. <laughs> well, hopefully. But you also, I mean, there's always the, um, the flip side, which is people go, what a great story. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and you're but like they don't have like the re inner reflection of oh, does this apply to me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of that, but then I figure you know what? That's the beauty of it, though, right? And same with the comedians. Like, if you're a person who's not 
self-analytical and you don't want to grow, or I shouldn't even say that because I don't think anybody doesn't want to grow. But what I mean is if you're not actively looking for ways to grow, you can still enjoy a good story, even if you're not pulling life lessons from it, you know. But if you are somebody who wants to think about things and develop, then there's an opportunity to do that as well. And you can do both in a story as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, yeah, I'm glad that you guys, I love it. I have to say it is the joy of my life when I get comments from people saying stuff like that, that you said, Haley, cause I'm like, that is seriously like, like that's the goal of my life. I love to be a vehicle for other people where it's not even about me, if that makes sense. Like it's not, oh, Amy told me this thing, so I should listen to it. It's just, I had this thought from this thing. And like, that's really cool. I love that. It's my I feel like, I feel like that's what storytelling has probably always been, you know, like for humans. And, and I think that it's a testament to just how awesome your audience is. I mean, to you, how loyal they are to you, that, that you, that, that is coming across because you know, you, you put so much of that. It's so deep into your stories. And, uh, I'm sorry. I'm so stuffy. Um, you're that I'm not about to cry. I promise. <laughs> um, that, you know, it really comes across. And I think that's why we all just adore you so much in your stories and the characters, because, um, you have that kind of wisdom that comes through with it too. So. Yeah. And I agree. And I would ask also add that you bring so much life to your characters. They actually feel like actual people. Cause I've read stories where the author's voice really doesn't change from character to character, but yours, <laughs> they actually have distinct like thumbprints of their own DNA. That is a and, huge and that, flattery to me as a writer. Thank you. That's always my goal well, is I want my characters to feel like real people. Cause they feel like that to me. They really do. Cause they have their own voice and they have their own thought processes and the way they react to things. It just seems like I'm actually diving into an actual world with real people. And I don't yeah. get that with every book. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all are making me uncomfortable with the happy feelings. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. it's very true. <laughs> Thank you. I, I really, you, it really is like, um, it is literally a dream come true to have conversations like this with you guys. Yeah. And I know I say that, but I really mean it. Like this is <laughs> the thing that I've dreamed about since I was a kid to have readers that are as engaged with my stories as I am and want to hear all the ins and outs of how things happened or why. And like, there's just, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I said that we've got Thanksgiving coming up this, this, month and I'm like I need to do something to recognize that God literally made my dreams come true this year <laughs> like we'll life be thankful dreams. around your table <laughs> with Aww. that it Would says you... you'll be very thankful around that table yeah well this is the other thing like I say to people in the comments all the time thank you so much I really mean it and I do but I realize there's only so many ways to say the phrase thank you or I'm grateful or whatever. And it starts to sound like you're just saying it. You know what I mean? It starts to sound like you're just yeah. putting it out there because you know, it's the right thing to say. And I wish it didn't. I wish there was like new and exciting ways to say thank you. <laughs> because well, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm just like uh, every day, every day I sit there and go, I can't believe this is happening. Like I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe the response that Zev is getting. I didn't think it was going to happen. And I'm like, it's just so unique and different. And I like that. And I think people are recognizing it. Well, I hope I so. If it's any consolation, Amy, I, I think that from a reader standpoint, they're getting the gift. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like they're getting that gift from you. And, and I know that you get it back from the reader's comments too, but it also, you always sound super genuine. So you never come across as being, you know, just, oh, I'm saying thank you because I need to. Um, so you're giving us a gift. Just think of it that way. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It no, I would, I would agree. Thanks, ladies. It doesn't, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it feels like I'm the one getting all the gain here, but I, I really appreciate mm. that. And I'm really 
excited that you feel that way. Like, it doesn't get better than that, really, when everybody's happy. <laughs> everybody is winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got a real win-win situation. Sorry, that's a web novel. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> thing. Well, well, I'm afraid, I also lady... feel a little guilty, Oh, sorry. Too, go ahead. I, was, I feel a little guilty, too, as a reader, because I'm, like, greedy in my wanting more from you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish... See, this is no. the thing that I... Because serialization is just a whole new model for me. And I see that there is more to it than just the story. There is the community that revolves around each book. And that adds to the experience. And I love that. Um, but I do also feel like it's a ruthless way. <laughs> ruthless yeah. way to tell a story. Um, and I love it, there. I'm really torn about the cliffhanger thing. Cause I love when people are like, no, <laughs> like I love those comments where people give me the awesome gifts of like, you know, the office and stuff. Um, <laughs> I love that. Like as an author, it's like fuel, you know, when people are like, I need it now. Like that's wonderful. But on the personal side I feel really bad because I'm like constantly leaving these people in a state of frustration <laughs> so there's no <laughs> winning because because you know part of me is like give me more and then there's another part of me is like no be nice so <laughs> just so you know I am internally torn um don't feel bad I did the, the the I'll tell you true story the day I wrote which was before it started publishing the day I wrote the cliffhanger where he says, or Zev says to Sasha, I still oh, love just... you. And she yeah, and says, then... what? And he's like, you heard me. And then he starts to take off his clothes. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. I literally, I was sitting at the dining table because I was cooking when I wrote that. I was sitting at the dining table and I wrote that and I laughed out loud because the first <laughs> thing that popped into my mind was the reader responses that were going to happen when that was and the then end in of the reality chapter. and my husband's in the di in the living room next to me and he goes what are you laughing about and i'm like i just wrote the best cliffhanger ever <laughs> i'm like but then i can't wait reality, for them to it read it came for it to come back cuz of the way you had it set up <laughs> Because it, it ended on, like, your weekend day, and we had to wait two days. Oh, yeah. you know and that was not on purpose, either. That was 100%. <laughs> I did not realize that that happened. Because when I go in to load the chapters up, I'm not reading them as I'm posting them. I'm just doing them by right. numbers, right? So I'm just loading that one, and then that one, and then that one. And it never occurred to me to check and, oh. and so I did not do that on purpose. Hand on heart. No, I did I'm not sure know. you didn't do it on purpose, but it felt like it. I know. Night. <laughs> I'm like, God so does off. have a sense of humor. He's like, <laughs> let the ladies wait to see him take off his clothes. Um, <laughs> I just thought, and it's I will... funny because again, did not see that line coming. Like when I was writing it, he was going to say, you heard me. And then I was like, well, no, because the next thing he has to do is take off his clothes. Because otherwise they're going to rip when he shifts. I'm like, oh, this is brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I knew he was going to shift. And I was like, oh, crap, what's going to happen? Is she going to freak out? You know, that was my thought was like, what is Sasha? What is Sha Sasha going to do? Yeah. And then I had to wait two days to see her reaction. I was like, what the hell? I'm sorry. Hey, and I didn't know until those chapters were published. And some people, maybe it was you guys, told me in the comments yeah. that apparently usually in werewolf novels, when the guy shifts, the girl's like, oh, isn't he beautiful? I was like, really? <laughs> I don't think that's how I'd react if a no. man turned into a wolf in front of me. Not in everyone, but I think yours was the most authentic and realistic. So, well, just that get ready said. for more of that because Sasha lacks filters when she's under stress. <laughs> oh, I love it about her because, yeah, I relate to her more than any other of your female leads. <laughs> that's funny. I think she's more like me. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I think she's probably... I mean, she's not me, but that sort of, she's got a similar sense of humor and she definitely, I, I definitely lose my filters under stress. I start verbal <laughs> diarrhea um, when I'm under stress. And so I See, think it's funny. I, it's something you can use in fiction to be funny. Yeah. It's I love it. It's not generally funny like, in real life. I even, I even was cracking up on 
the couch and I was reading that scene where she's like, don't make me lick you or whatever. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm not going to let you so make hard. me lick you. Yeah. And I was laughing so hard. And my husband was like, what are you laughing about? And I let him read it. And he goes, what the hell are you reading? <laughs> so you can't let people read these things out of context because they sound ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I just was cracking up so bad. It was funny. <laughs> I just thought that line was hilarious because, again, those a lot of those things come up. Like a lot of those things aren't pre-planned. I know I've got to get her from A to B, and she's in this state. But I'm not really. I'm. It's not like I write out the dialogue usually. Usually that just comes as I write the scene. But um, it, it, every so often you have these little gem moments where something like that happens. Oh, you yeah. go, oh no, I can use this, you know. <laughs> yeah, that was gold. It was I so thought gold. that was, was really funny. Perfect. I'm, it's good to know that the things that make me laugh are the same things that make you guys laugh. Because um, that sometimes, you know, you, you can't be sure. <laughs> Sometimes you're well, like, what are they going to think <laughs> about this strange thing I just had this character do? But there's a lot of yeah. forgiveness for um, animal shapeshifters and their unique um, cultures, I'm finding. Well, that's probably because most writers that write in that kind of vein, they kind of deviate on the lore for their own book. But mm -hmm. they, um, so you, you are in that realm of you can deviate. From it and yeah. people will be okay because it happens so much anyway yeah that's good yes well i am truly grateful for you guys for showing up and um and for showing up for zev and sasha as well because like i say i i genuinely was actually nervous like butterflies in my stomach nervous about this book and wh whether people were going to be interested in it or not so um i am really thankful that everybody so far has um you know come on board and even though i didn't intend to have the crossover of this one starting in beast i had actually intended to finish beast before i started this one but here we are <laughs> It's oh, gonna... when you have a werewolf contest, it kind of kicks your yes. writing in gear. And we had no warning on that. We learned about it at the same time everybody else did. It went it's out. Weird. On don't the do app. that. Like, you'd think that they would let authors know beforehand. Well, I think they learned from Spirity because the prizes are so big. On the the werewolf competition actually has bigger prizes than Spirity, which they've never done before. Um, oh. And I think when what they learned from Spirity, because everybody knew Spirity was coming and they prepared in advance and we had books planned and, you know, pre-written and chapters stockpiled and the whole thing, they had this huge bottleneck of thousands of books entering the app on the same day or the same couple days. Um, mm -hmm. And it created a whole bunch of problems in the back end with legal and contracts and vetting. And there's just a whole raft of issues that they had. So I suspect they decided not to warn us about this one because they knew it would then spread out the the releases and give them mm. time to kind of. Especially because uh, you said the deadline is in December, right? Well, the actual deadline is the 5th of January. But uh, oh, you have to have 100,000 okay. words published by the 5th of January. So there are some, like, there's a couple big authors that have only just released their books in the past week. Um, but they'll do more chapters between now and um, January to make sure that they've hit the word count. Um, yeah, they're doing this one a lot faster. Sparity took six months. They're doing this one in three. Okay. So um, that's good. I think, um, because we don't have to pursue things that don't pan out. I think a lot of authors with Sparity books, they lost their momentum. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they've learned from that as well. Um, so, yeah. But apparently there is a huge appetite for werewolf books right now. So they certainly have plenty of them. <laughs> In the in the pipeline, we were looking at the the monthly rankings the other day. And my husband goes alpha, 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 mate, mate, alpha. <laughs> He's just reading through all the titles. I'm like, yeah, well, that's what happens when you offer ten thousand dollars. So, 
<laughs> Dang, that's the prize? <laughs> the first prize is $10,000. There's eight prizes, and they range from 2000 to 10000 Wow, um, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's that's a big prize pool. They have not had that before. Oh, bye, Chelly. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry we didn't get to chat. Um, yeah, so it's a big deal. Um, and yeah, so I'm just praying. <laughs> it's straight well, I'll up be praying. voting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's going to be an event for the second half of November around uh, Alpha to get it kicked off. And then there's going to be an event in the first half of December for Christmas slash End of Beast. I'm kind of combining the two. Um, so there's going to be a bunch of giveaways. Bunch of giveaways in December. Um, That'll be fun. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about it. I hope you... Oh, you know what? Before we go... Did I post them already? Oh, you know what? I did it in the reader survey. And I don't think anybody's looked at it. Um, I'll post them down in the text chat. So I wanted to know, honest, honest, what is it? Honest Abraham, whatever. I need to know for real whether you guys, so I had, you guys know I did some mugs and this was supposed to be part of the Christmas slash end of beast giveaways. I'm going to go into the text for voice chat. Um, and I'm not happy with how they came out and I don't know whether to use them or not whether and so I need like honest um <laughs> into them the the top writing is unclear like you can read it especially if you know what it says but it doesn't look good the top line of writing um and I don't know whether to include them in the giveaways or maybe make them kind of like a booby prize. Like, oh, you didn't win anything else, but here, you can have my mug that looks kind of crappy, but at least I did it. <laughs> and it's signed on the bottom. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so I was wondering what you guys are thinking. Are you guys in the... Uh, oh, <laughs> maybe look at... I'd have them. Uh... I know people would have them, but what... Uh, thank you, sweetie. I didn't mean that. To, oh, I know. So what my question is, when I show people, here's all the prizes you can win. Are people going to look at that and go, oh, I don't really want that one when there's other things that look better? Do you know what I mean? Or does that look like a fun prize regardless? And um, and I can put it up as because I don't want people to be like. <laughs> I don't want, this is my personal pride coming through. I don't want people to be like, she thinks that looks good. <laughs> Because I know oh. it doesn't. I was really disappointed with how the top writing came out. Well, to be perfectly honest, I think most people being selfish and kind of thinking just about themselves will probably think that it isn't that great, but your truest fans would love to have it. <laughs> Agree. We would love to have it. <laughs> that is a really good way to put that. I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. So maybe what I'll do is I'll only give these ones away in Discord. <laughs> I'm just joking. Maybe, no, yeah. I, I think you're right, though, because, you know. No, I think by comparison to some of the other stuff that I have, they're going to look not as cool. You know what I mean? But at yeah, the same no, time. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, that's always going to be the case, though. There's always going to be people who are like, oh, I like this giveaway item better or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. Maybe you know, what I'll do is I'll have the giveaway. You know what? The way I'm doing it, people can just not enter for these ones. I can just, uh, because just the way I'm them. doing it, it's like a day by day thing. So I can well, show people the prize for that day and they can just not enter if they don't want them. Well, that's there a good go. solution. True. That's a good yeah. compromise. <laughs> I don't Leave care if you think them. they suck. Just don't yeah. get the prize that day. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I'd be like, "Ooh, Amy touched this with her yeah. own hands." Oh, yeah, God. <laughs> I'd be like, no. she made this. Oh, it's so beautiful. She you know signed what? them. I'll make sure that you win it, and I'll blow my nose and put it in a tissue inside it. Oh, God. Then, your DNA, then we'll be even more. Oh happy. my God! <laughs> no. Give us a little. 
Give us Any... a little clip of your hair. Your beautiful that, hair. That sounds, That's just getting that creepy. Sounds so much, <laughs> that sounds so much middle school. It's not even funny. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm making it's a friendship a, that's what my kids out of would my say. hair. <laughs> Seriously, remember those oh. friendship bracelets we used to make? Yes, I wonder if I still I, know I how those. to do those. That would be I've hilarious. seen those. I've seen those made out of horse hair, so I think yes. it would totally work. <laughs> horse <laughs> hair, so funny. Yeah, yeah, I've seen those too. Yeah, and you can actually get a thread and wrap your own hair around the thread, so then it actually looks thicker. I've seen a lot of people do that too. You know what you should do here? Why? Do, let's just give her a bunch of money. Yeah, um, no, do. Why don't you do like the little wedding ring, you know, that like um, Gari gives to Callie or whatever? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what? I'd I would love to, but I don't even that. know how. Like, I wouldn't even know <laughs> how to do oh, that. That is a great like... idea. I, I almost, if I had more time, one of the things I was going to do, I had found these um, books that are made with antique paper and they look old and they've got like leather. And they have to be like Ooh. tied closed and stuff like that. Oh. And I was going Ooh. to write Reth's journal and like oh. have it as a giveaway. But oh. I just don't have time. I mean, the reality is I would love to spend my time doing stuff like that, but I just can't. <laughs> and I looked <laughs> at it and I almost ideas, bought though. a couple of them on Amazon. I thought, no, they're going to sit on my drawer and they're going to never get done. And then I'm going to be like, why did I just spend 50 bucks on two journals that nobody ever gets to see? (laughs) The wedding ring is a good idea, but I don't even know how I would do it is the problem because I don't know how to do leather work. (laughs) Yeah, actually, I have a friend that does do leather works, but uh, I don't know. I could ask him. Well, just so you know, there is a uh, fan who owns a T-shirt printing shop. And she oh. and I are in discussions about some shirt stuff. And if That's it comes cool. off, it's nice. going to be really cool. Awesome. She actually made a shirt herself as a fan that I love, um, that I think you guys are going to get to see in December. And and I love it. So, oh, that's awesome. But it's about, it's about awesome. being a fan. It's not about a specific book, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Because there's limits to what I'm allowed to do with copyright and stuff like that. Um, like but with giveaways, I'm allowed to. So yes. I am going to try and get a couple things done um, for the December giveaways that are book specific for for Ref. But we'll see. We will see. That'll but be yeah. fun. Cool. I think so too. Anyway, I'm really sorry, ladies. I have a three o'clock appointment. I have to go. I'm already 20 minutes later than I was supposed to be. Because <laughs> I love talking happens to you all so the much. time. <laughs> I know. I love talking to you guys. This is. Can this just be my job? No. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna go. But thank you seriously for coming today, and also um, just for being awesome, supportive in general. Um, and yeah, keep an eye on things because there's some fun stuff coming up, and I'm excited for you guys to to celebrate it with me. You're welcome. Thank you, for the, thank you so much. No, yeah, I you. really yeah. needed the break. So did I. Thank so, you, Mame Luca. Y'all. So, you know what? I can get back to my courses now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you all take care, and I will talk to you around. And, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being friends. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.